Let's talk about carbonyl compound reduction stereochemistry. And one of the things that I feel like is really worth noting in these type of reactions is you're going from an sb2 molecule you have some type of a I'm just gonna go ahead and put it in brackets a reduction reaction and what you're getting out of that is an sp3 hybridized molecule so obviously there's gonna be some consequences uh, sterically to deal with so the I guess the outcome of this all depends on what the structure is of your reducing agent and whether or not that reducing agent is a chiral compound or whether or not it's a chiral compound or whether or not the compound is chiral or a chiral that sounds a little bit better so if you have an a chiral reducing agent what you're going to get out of this is either an a chiral product or because it's sp3 a racemic mixture but what's more important is the chiral reducing agents because that's going to give us some selectivity so we're going to say that the chiral reducing agents are enantio selective which is just science for it it's, uh, ones that specify a specific enantiomer and there's s cbs is the name of the molecule and the other molecule and this is obviously abbreviations is not s cbs but r cbs and in both, and it doesn't really give so much detail on the mechanism behind how this reaction works, but in both of these circumstances, the reactive species is, or the reactive agent is a BH3. So in SCVS, the hydride is going to be attacking at the front. Where might you be wondering, does the hydride come from? Well, that hydride comes from BH3, and it doesn't give too much details on how this reaction really partakes, but just know that the hydride attacks at the front. So what are the consequences of this being? Well, if your hydride is attacking at the front, and I'll draw out the mechanisms between each and every one of these, this is going to give you the R, uh, the, the R alcohol enantiomer. So this is kind of counterintuitive, right? The SCBS gives us the R <laughs> alcohol. And so in an RCBS, as you can imagine, I think you know where this is going, the hydride nucleophile is going to attack at the back, giving us the S configuration for an, our, our alcohol, which is, again, kind of counterintuitive, but at the same time, I guess it's nice that you can rem remember that it's always going to be in reverse. Okay, so let's just kind of elaborate a little bit on the whole SCBS thing versus the RCBS thing. So I'm going to start off drawing a general mechanism for how SCBS works. And this is a very enantioselective reducing reagent. Oh, I feel so fancy, don't I? So say that you have a phenyl group here attached to your carbonyl of whatever your molecule is going to be. And I'll just make this a methyl group here so that we can just being realistic and not using abstract concepts to explain things. And uh, at the very front of your molecule, so this is the S-C-B-S reaction mechanisms. And at the very front of that though, I'm gonna draw it real big to show that it's, it's coming out at you in the plane is a, the hydrogen end of our BH3, which is the reactive substance in this. So this is a front side nucleophile attack. And I'll go ahead and use my electron pushing arrows in magenta. And it does what, what all nucleophiles do. And it, it, it releases the hydride in there, just like it would with if, if it was BH4. Um, and then the lone pairs move up here. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw what happens. We're going from an sp2 and we're going to be forming an sp3 molecule. So, um, and I'll just go ahead and include it just because it's not really that important, but we also, I mean, it's important, but it's kind of almost implied at this point, run these reactions in water. And what you get out of that is R, C, CH3. That's all still in the plane of the molecule, but this is attacking from the front. So if you can imagine this as being big, it's coming in here and this is being pushed away uh, from, from us in space. So I'm gonna go ahead and just draw this I would, as that 
and obviously I'm going to have a wedge, my wedge is going to have my hydroxyl group there, and on that is going to have the hydrogen from the BH3 reaction. So I don't really know what this is, but let's go ahead and use the single swap rule to assign, a, I guess, a pre-log system. So I, I may, I'm, I don't know if you noticed, but I switched this R to, to a phenyl group, uh, or may I switch the phenyl group to an R. Let me correct my mistake there. And there's a phenyl group there. And now I'm gonna go ahead and number my priorities uh, to see what the confirmation is. So this is obviously number one because it has an oxygen. That's number two because it has a phenyl attached to it. That's number three because it has a methyl group and hydrogen is number four. So if I look at the directionality of this molecule and I just go ahead and follow the old school rules, I'm going from here to here to here. What direction is that look like to you? Well, the directionality of it is an S configuration, but because my number four priority is not in, it's not a dash, it's a wedge, it's coming out of me, I know that it's not an S confirmation, but rather that it is a R confirmation. And whenever you do this reaction, that this is not a 100% an antioselective reaction. The R confirmation I'm gonna get about 97% of the time. Even with SCBS, I'm still gonna get some S confirmation molecule about 3% of my reaction, which is important when you're, when we'll talk about something else. But that's, that's with SCBS. Now let's compare that with, um, I'll just use gold again, comparing that with RCBS. Ah. I'm gonna use a real example. I hate I hate abstract stuff. Let's use real real molecules here, not, not substituted ones. Okay, so I'm just gonna make that a pH, a phenyl group. There's a CH3 there. There's an O, and I'm gonna draw this as this is SCBS, I'm gonna draw it as RCBS. So RCBS, as we talked about is a backside attack. So I'm gonna draw that really, really small here that this, so this is a line that I'm just gonna reiterate here. This is R, CBS. And in the back of this molecule, I'm gonna to go to write it real small. It's the hydrogen there, attached to it is a BH2, there. And what I generally tend to get out of this is a backside nucleophilic attack. So it's going to come here. If you can imagine, this molecule is in the plane, but once it does that, it's attacking from behind. So this, this oxygen, I'm just going to draw the lone pairs moving here. This oxygen is going to be pulled kind of, or pushed forward towards me, towards, towards the person watching this in that direction. And behind it, I'm going to have a hydrogen. So let's go ahead and just draw out what the result of this is. Again, I'm going to add water to deal with that uh, anion that I form here, so there's my pH, my phenyl group. That doesn't change, that's still in the plane. There's my methyl group, that's still in the plane. Then I have a wedge, and then I have a dash. And my wedge is going to be my hydroxyl group, and my dash is going to be the hydrogen that was acting as a nucleophile from the BH3. So now let's just use um, the whole single swap rule, if needed, to figure out what the conformation is of this molecule. So the oxygen is my number one priority, the phenyl group is my number two priority, the methyl group is my number three, and then the hydrogen would be my number four, since it's in the wedge. It's a, a dash and in the plane, I don't have to worry about any swap going on. So let's just see what we have here. Going from one to two, and then from two to three, what does that look like? Well, I'm going to the left, and this is a S confirmation. My lowest priority is already behind me in, in a, a dash confirmation, so I don't have to worry about any single swap. That is what you get with an R configuration. Now, again, 97% of the time, 95, 96, 97, whoever you ask, it's gonna be a lot. You're gonna get the S confirmation. However, you're still gonna get the R confirmation about 3% of the time. And this can cause certain, I don't want to say that it causes problems, but it can make things difficult later on. So one of the great examples of why I quit chemical engineering and then decided to be a molecular biology major is because 
Your cells are the best organic chemists on the planet. They're the best chemists, period. They can synthesize compounds at an efficiency that I, we still can't comprehend, yet we have the, you know, the, the arrogance to, to try to make our own stuff. So a molecule called NADH acts as a reducing agent. I'm just going to write that in parentheses, that it's a reducing agent. It works very much like the reaction that we just talked about. The H there is going to be the hydride nucleophile that's going to attack to it. And what you get out of that, obviously, is going to be NAD+. If you take in general biology, you know what I'm talking about with the electron transport chain. And this is a molecule that can be derived from B vitamins, which I think is cool. That's why we need to have them. Uh, it's an oxidizing agent as well, which makes sense because of its presence there. And let's just go ahead and draw a generic structure for, or a substituted structure for what this actually, what this looks like. It's also a, I don't think I mentioned this, it's a coenzyme. What is a coenzyme? Well, coenzyme is a organic compound that helps in, that acts as a catalyst, I guess, or increases the reactivity of regular enzymes. Um, so as opposed to a cofactor, it, it binds into the reactive site and helps the reactions proceed at much faster rates on their own. But this is what it looks like. So you have over here is just an NH2 group attached to a carbonyl carbon. And attached to that carbonyl carbon is a ring system. And part of that ring system contains a nitrogen there. I wonder if this nitrogen contributes to aromaticity or the lone pairs. Sorry, that's a cheesy example. And you have two hydrogens here coming off of your group. So that's the generic structure of it. Why is this is so important? Because this is a 100% enantioselective uh, re reducing agent. And what makes this so awesome is because not, uh, every amino acid in your body, so every, it's not just in your body, on planet Earth, amino acid has the S configuration. We have no idea why <laughs> it has that configuration. There's a lot of speculation and a lot of arguments going on about why, but every amino acid inside of every protein in your body that you need for every reaction to maintain homeostasis for you to exist as a species and for you to exist at this point in time, every amino acid has the S configuration, the left-handed configuration. No one knows what this is. This has been the basis of a lot of science fiction though. So I have down here in this picture is a picture of a quarian, particularly Tally, if you're ever a fan of Mass Effect, which I am, and one of the coolest things about that is the Corians all have an R amino acid chirality. And I think there's this one like point in the time where you, you like get, you live out your like Captain Kirk fantasies and uh, <laughs> they're like, well, we can't get sick because our amino acids are completely different. They have different chirality centers between the two. This has been the base of a lot of science fiction, super cool reactions, super cool reducing agent. Can't